Twitch, um, uh, I had a internet hiccup and I need to reconnect to Zoom. Give me a sec. Technical difficulties, la la la. Hmm, what's wrong with Zoom? <laughs> the internet problem was my fault, but I don't think the I think the Zoom problem is Zoom's fault. So let's try one more time. Maybe I should quit Zoom and re reconnect. Okay, let's quit Zoom. Um, Twitch, if you've got any random questions, um, lob them at me and I'll, I'll see what I can answer while I'm fixing the, uh, NYU, NYU Zoom, you Zoom. Um, when is the PyTorch podcast coming back? That's a great question. So um, I'll be returning from parental leave uh, next week, and um, I need to figure out how I want to redo the podcast, and then I will do it that way. Hi, folks. We're back. Sorry about that. My internet basically stopped for like 10 seconds, and then Zoom refused to reconnect. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Oh, uh, they can't hear me. Hi, I'm unmuted. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, they can hear me now. All right, let's get started. Um, yeah, so for folks who don't know, um, we, we, I was chatting on Twitch because Twitch came back before Zoom did. Um, uh, I, I also do a podcast about work-related topics um, because at work I work on PyTorch, and uh, so I have a podcast about that. It's in the Twitch chat if you want to go take a look. Okay, so um, let's get back to it. So where was I? So I was talking about church encodings, um, how that's how you represent data in the setting. And um, yeah, so it's interesting. You, it, whenever you have data, you can represent it as code. And so there is this duality where you know one can be the other. Um, there's some other things that um, are interesting to look at when we're looking at the lambda calculus. So for example, the lambda calculus is just a syntax. It doesn't actually tell you how to run your program. So when you add um, a strategy for how to evaluate terms of the lambda calculus, well, you know, that's also something interesting. So uh, we've talked about how Haskell is a lazy programming language and how traditional languages are eager. And indeed, in the lambda calculus, we can study the difference between, you know, what is a call by value, aka eager language, and what is a call by name, uh, aka, well, uh, lazy with, with a caveat. So um, we'll, we'll see the caveat in more detail shortly. And finally, um, uh, and we won't talk about this today, but um, when you take the lambda calculus and you put a type system on it, that is to say, you know, you say what the types of things uh, in your program are, well, now you basically have um, a entry into the huge body of programming languages research, which, you know, can kind of be boiled down to, you know, let's take the lambda calculus, let's add some extra stuff on it, let's add a type system on it, and hey, We've got a programming language, and we can study this programming language, and you know, see all sorts of interesting things about it. So, you know, the first upgrade from the lambda calculus is what we call the simply typed lambda calculus, which, as you might imagine, is simple. And then, you know, we can add things like polymorphism. We can add things like dependent types, um, and so forth. So. So another good reason to learn lambda calculus is if you are interested in programming languages research, um, you know, you want to um, read some papers from academia, you're going to need to know the lambda calculus because they're all going to assume that you know what the lambda calculus is to understand that. Um, there was a quick uh, question on the Zoom about uh, video stream lagging. If Zoom is lagging, um, you could try checking out the Twitch stream. Uh, that might be better quality. Give it a try. All right. So what's our plan for today? Uh, well, uh, in the um, in the uh, hour I have, um, we're going to first talk about the lambda calculus. Um, we, we already did a little bit on the first lecture, but I'm going to recap it 
and go into a little more detail. Then we'll talk about capture avoiding substitution, which is sort of like the, the meat and bones of this lecture. Like, uh, well, basically everything we're going to do with lambda calculus is going to be all about capture avoiding substitution. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about evaluation order um, and how, you know, we can use the lambda calculus to like see the difference between different types of evaluation order. Okay, so let's recap the syntax of the lambda calculus. So as I mentioned, uh, in the lambda calculus, um, it's a language with only three possible expressions. So one is the variable, one is the lambda, and the other is a uh, function application. So there's these three, and if you forget what these are, you know, they're all on the um, right-hand side of the screen. So take a peek if you need to remember. I've given translations of this syntax into JavaScript and into Haskell. So you can also use that to refresh um, what's going on. And so here are some example terms. I'm still with a sort of hokey extra uh, arithmetic. Um, remember that lambda calculus technically doesn't actually have arithmetic, but it's, it's just helpful to like have these in like informal examples because uh, they're like easy to read and reason about. So for example, this is a function that takes a x and then returns two plus x. So it's a function that adds two to its argument. And then when we apply this to five, we get seven. But, uh, and for finally, the example that we had uh, in the original lecture, um, actually this is not an example in the original lecture, but this is a higher order function. So this one uh, is a lambda that takes an f, which is gonna be expected to be a function because we're gonna apply three to it. And so when I pass in lambda x, x plus one to this function, I get four because I took that function and called it with three and the function that I passed in adds one and so it's four. And in these examples, I've added tons of parentheses, but in a lot of situations you can omit the parentheses. And um, also uh, I um, talked about how we evaluate in the lambda calculus and this is done using substitution. So. Oh, uh, so what's going on here? So I have uh, I have this lambda term, and um, I have an application. So on the outermost, um, what we call red x, that is to say, um, you know, a lambda term applied to some other term. Uh, we have a lambda as an argument, and we have f as the thing we're going to substitute in. So to evaluate this lambda expression, what we are going to do is we are going to take the f and replace all occurrences with it with whatever the argument was, in this case, lambda y plus one. So I've highlighted it to make it clear, right? So I'm gonna substitute all f's with, which are in blue with this red term. And so in the second line here, we see that this f has been substituted with a red term and this has been substituted as well. And then we do it again for x, in this case, substituting y with x. And then we do it again for the y here, giving us x plus one plus one. And then finally, we get our final result, which is that if I, you know, uh, take a function and return the function that calls that function twice, well, for a function like this, where the function was add one to the thing, the final thing I get adds two in this case. Um, so are there any questions so far with the recap? All right. Um, Oh, one more, one more recap thing, which is that um, uh, when we have higher order functions, and in particular when we have functions that return functions, the functions that I return from uh, the outer functions remember what the arguments of the functions were in question. And in the substitution model, um, aka how we evaluate lambda calculus, this happens sort of kind of automatically, right? Because the way I said that we handle a application is that we substitute all occurrences of x with the number in question. Uh, so uh, in this case, I'm going to substitute all occurrences of x with two. And so now I get this function lambda y two. So the two is remembered, even though you know it's not there anymore because I substituted the x with two. When I finally call this lambda with three, I will return two. This is a very uninteresting lambda. It ignores its argument and always returns two in this situation. Okay, um, so I mentioned that the parentheses are optional. And in fact, um, the Lambda Calculus has the same rules for when it's okay to omit parentheses as Haskell does. So if you played around with higher order functions or, or, or like when you did the labs, you had, to write, um, you had to write function applications, you may have noticed that it was okay to omit parentheses in some cases. And so I wanna just uh, you know, reiterate what the rules are here. So when I, um, uh, 
so first off, um, if I want to write a lambda expression that has multiple arguments, I don't have to keep writing lambda x dot lambda y dot blah. Um, there's just a shorthand notation which just says you can say lambda, all of the arguments you want to take to the function, and then your dot, and then the expression in question. So this is just equivalent to writing a function that says lambda x dot, and then lambda y dot e. So like Haskell, the lambda calculus is curried. And it has to be curried because, well, there's no nothing else you can do, right? There, there's no other um, data types. Everything is a function. So if you want to take multiple arguments, well, you better you know, first take an argue, function that takes one argument and then return another function that takes the second argument you are waiting for. Um, similarly, application is left associative. So if I say f, x, y, um, and intuitively this is calling f with two arguments, that just means first apply f of x and then apply y onto the function that got returned in that case. But most of the time, if you're just reasoning about Haskell code, reasoning about lambda calculus code, you'll just read fxy as, oh, call it with two arguments. But it's helpful to remember that under the hood, um, there's this repeated application going on. And in particular, this is different than the other parenthesization order, which is f and then open paren x, y, which says, please apply the function x with an argument y, and then whatever that result is, apply that to f. So these are not the same thing. Make sure you don't mess up the parentheses here. And it's very important not to put parentheses in the wrong place. Um, similarly, uh, when we um, write lambda x dot fx, uh, you might imagine it's a little ambiguous, um, you know, like, is the f part of the lambda? Is the x part of the lambda? And the answer is, when you have a lambda, um, you always go all the way to the end, right? Until a terminating parentheses or just the end of the expression. So this is equivalent to having put a parentheses around the f and the x. And once again, this is different than the other possible parenthesization, which would be um, a very um, curious function that says lambda x dot f apply to x. And that is probably not what you want in this situation. Um, so, and the reminder at the bottom of the slide that this is exactly the rules of Haskell. So if you know how Haskell works, you know how to parse lambda calculus as well. Just replace the backslashes with lambdas. Um, so the lambda calculus is only got these three things, right? So you might imagine, you know, how can I do anything useful in a language like this? And so one of the things that, you know, in most programming languages you want to be able to do is you want to be able to like write top level declarations, which you can use in your program. Like, you know, in JavaScript, you can write a function f and then call it. So can you do that in Lambda Calculus? Well, this particular, you know, like series of statements, that's not supported in the Lambda Calculus. But we can actually, um, you know, sort of emulate this with a little bit of extra work. In particular, um, when you have global function declarations like this, which taken an f, well, what you just imagine is, you know, this is just some function f where uh, uh, some, some function that takes f as an argument. And, you know, when we have lambda, fun uh, lambda functions, they take arguments and name them, and then you can refer to them by name. So the body is exactly the same as it is in Haskell, and then all we need to do is just successfully feed in the um, actual implementations of each of the functions as we go. So, hey, um, you don't actually need top-level declarations, right? You can just imagine your program as being a giant lambda expression, and then uh, at the bottom you just append on all of the all of the um, functions that you want to have defined. Um, there's a slight caveat, which is what if the functions are recursive? And to do that in the lambda calculus, you need to use the y combinator, which makes you lets you do recursive recursion. Similarly, in Haskell, we talked about this let expression, right? We can say let x equal e1 in e2. And to simulate this in the lambda calculus, all you would do is you would just um, take your e2 as before, um, bind it up into a lambda that binds x, and then apply e1 to x, right? And that has the same effect. It binds e1 to x inside the body of e2, which is exactly what let expressions do. So you, don't, you technically don't need let expressions either. Um, one more thing that I want to talk about uh, when we're talking about syntax is the distinction between so-called bound variables and free variables. So when I give you a lambda expression like lambda x dot x, um, this is sort of um, closed in some sense. Namely, we can look at this and we know exactly what the meaning of this function is. Namely, it's a function that takes its argument and returns it, the identity function. 
When we have a variable x where we can see where the x is bound, namely in the lambda x, we call this a bound variable because, well, it's bound. Um, we also call these so-called closed terms because um, they are a closed universe. They don't refer to any um, variables that don't exist anywhere else. Let's contrast this with this other function, lambda x dot y. All I've done is renamed the inner, um, uh, inner variable to be y. But now when we look around in our program, there's no binding site for y. So in fact, we don't know what this y means. Um, we're relying on um, this uh, program, this lambda expression being part of some larger lambda expression that will actually tell us what the meaning of y is. So this is a free variable. It's not bound, it's free. And, um, and we refer to these uh, types of lambda terms as so-called open terms. And um, you can think of the difference between these, right, is that the um, bound variable is like a you know, self-contained program, like you know, in the calculator lab, right? We, we didn't have any variables, but you know, we could always say what the uh, final computation result is. Whereas the, when you have an open term, you know, there's gonna be a bunch of like holes. There's gonna be a bunch of variables that you don't want, know that they are, and you can't really evaluate them because you need to actually fill them in at some point. Um, to hammer this point home, uh, when we have a, a closed term or when we have a bound variable, the name of the variable doesn't really matter. So in the previous slide, I wrote my identity function uh, saying lambda x dot x. So, you know, it takes in an x and returns x. If I say renamed it to be z, um, well, it's still an identity function, right? It still takes in its argument and returns it. So the name in some sense doesn't actually matter. Um, and this kind of makes sense, right? Like it's like how when you are writing your uh, programs in a normal programming language and you have a bunch of local parameters and you can rename them however you want, right? Like it doesn't really matter. So you just rename them for whatever clarity is. Whereas for a free variable, the name does matter because while you're referring to a Y from the external context. And if you um, uh, rename this to some, you know, other uh, name willy nilly, well, you know, why do you expect uh, whoever it is is actually going to provide the Y in the end also knew about that. So one way to think about this is um, a re reference to an internal variable. You can think of that as just a good old fashioned variable. But the Y here, you can think of it as like a library call, right? You're calling something um, externally, something external to your program. And so you don't, you need to actually, like the name actually matters, right? Because it tells you what you're actually gonna get. Um, there's a question here, which is, um, does the Y, could it, could it be a candidate for closure? Um, I'm not exactly sure what that question means, but um, uh, when we have bound variables like in above, um, when we do substitutions, we, we can still have like internal lambdas that get closed. So, so there, there is a good point, which is that you can think of, okay, let me, let me put it differently. When I have an open term, this is a, yes, this is the exact situation when a closure might be formed. Namely, when I'm working on whatever the, uh, the uh, surrounding context is, and then I substitute y, and now this y gets filled in with an actual value, and now I've produced a closure, right? I've produced a new lambda term that has remembered whatever the y is. But when you can't see the rest of the program, right, because maybe it's owned by someone else, or, you know, we're writing examples, and we, you know, are just writing these lambda terms because they're syntactically valid, then, you know, the name matters because you don't know. You just need to leave it unspecified. Um, and this, this, uh, this difference between bound and free variables shows up in a lot of places, right? Like when I, um, yeah, so this closure example is actually a really good example because when you look at functions and you see that they refer to things that, you know, aren't locally bound, you know, oh, they must be referring to something in the library or something in the enclosing context. So that's important. But bound and free variables also show up in a ton of other situations. For example, in the English language, um, I can say Jane hit herself, right? And this, um, this, uh, this, uh, this word herself is referring to a subject that was previously defined in the sentence Jane. Um, similarly, when I write mathematical notation, um, bound and free variables show up in a lot of different situations. For example, when I write an integral, uh, integrating x plus y um, by dx, um, dx actually is binding x, right? The x has no intrinsic meaning, 
um, except that you know the it's what the variable of integration is. And so x is a bound variable, and I could have written integral of z plus y dz, and that would have the exact same meaning. But of course, the y refers to something else, not part of the integral, and I'm not allowed to rename that. Logic has something similar um, with universal and existential quantification, and you know the good old-fashioned summation operator with the sigma. Well, you know that indexing variable that's also being bound by the summation itself. So they show up everywhere. They're, it's really useful to know these concepts. Um, so to summarize bound and free variables, um, we can formally define what the free variables of any given lambda expression are. Namely, um, if I have just a variable, then that variable is free, right? Because it's not bound anywhere. Similarly, if I have an application of E1 and E2, well, the free variables of this are uh, the free variables of E1 and the free variables of E2. And finally, uh, when I have a lambda expression, well, that binds X in this particular case. So I just take whatever the free variables of E were and just remove X from that set. And then um, just a little more vocabulary. Um, when I rename bound variables, um, this, is, this is a process called alpha conversion. So um, uh, all I, I can I can freely alpha convert without uh, changing the meaning of, of my expressions. Of course, I'm not allowed to pick any name, right? Because I'm not allowed to capture um, uh, free variables when I rename a lambda binary. For example, if I have lambda x dot y, that's not alpha convertible to lambda y dot y because well, if you look at these, these are just different functions. This function ignores its argument and always returns y. This function takes its argument and always returns it. So they're not the same program. So I can't just rename uh, to any name, um, but uh, as long as it doesn't capture the free variables, I'm okay. And this concept of lambda terms which are equivalent to each other via alpha conversion, that's alpha equivalence. And this is an equivalence relation and it upholds all the um, properties that you would expect to, uh, an equivalence relation to uphold. Um, what are your questions? Peek at the slide. Yes, so there was a request for me to re-explain the third example for what the free variables of lambda x dot e are. And so, um, so, the, so to rephrase this, this line is saying, if I have a lambda expression, what are the free variables of the lambda expression? Well, first, I want to recursively determine what the free variables of the expression are, right? Because like, you know, if it's lambda x dot y, z, a, b, c, well, then y, z, a, b, c all seem like very reasonable free variables. And then whatever that free variable set is, I want to make sure x is not part of it, right? Because I've just bound x with the lambda expression. So x is no longer, no longer free, it's bound. And then that's the free variables of this lambda expression. Um, one last note, and this will be relevant for the homework, um, which is uh, um, there's another way of doing naming, um, which is called the Brown indices. So remember I said that the name of bound variables doesn't matter. So one of the sort of annoying things about um, the plain old lambda calculus is you've got all these programs that are exactly the same, but they're syntactically different, right? Because you can choose a name. So what if you just got rid of the name entirely? And this is the concept behind the Brown indices. So instead of um, actually having explicit names in our programs, we instead use numbers. So the idea behind the number is that um, we just count how many lambdas outwards we want this variable to refer to. So in this particular example, I said zero as my variable, and that just means, hey, count to the first lambda expression, and that's what I'm bound to. So just flipping back, this is the identity function, and um, I get rid of all the names, and I just say, oh, well, you know, count zero lambdas out to find the lambda that is binding you. To do a more complicated example, let's imagine we've got this function, um, higher order function, it takes an x, takes a y, and then returns x, ignoring the uh, x. Well, this in de Brown notation translates into lambda, lambda one, right? And the one here means skip this lambda and um, use this lambda over here. Uh, remember that um, when I write lambdas, they go all the way to the right, right? So this is equivalent to having a parentheses around the lambda y dot x. And, um, Here's another example. So um, we have lambda x, and then the body of this lambda is a lambda uh, y dot x applied to an x. 
And when we translate this into the Brown notation, you can see the inner x um, is 1, because I need to skip over this lambda to get to the um, enclosing lambda. But the outer x is 0, because it's directly in the same context uh, that it was defined in. So you, you only count ex enclosing lambdas. So it's not like you, you start at the number and then you march left counting how many lambdas you get until you get there. It's, uh, it's more of a tree-based structure. And the great thing about the Brown indices is that now, whenever two lambda terms are alpha equivalent, they are in fact also equal syntactically in the Brown notation, right? Like lambda x, lambda y, x, this is the same program as lambda y, lambda x, y. And it's not clear here that this is the case, but it is definitely clear when you translate them into the Brown notation. This is the only program that uh, you know, has uh, that, uh, that semantics. Well, no, I, I shouldn't say that. This is the only program that has this exact structure. What are your questions? OK. So that's it for um, the lambda calculus, um, and in particular binders. And so now we're going to talk about capture avoiding substitution. In fact, I've already talked a little bit about capture avoidance when I talked about when it's permissible to um, alpha convert or not. So let's talk about substitution. So um, when I um, talked about define the lambda calculus, I was like, how do we run lambda calculus programs? We do them by substituting, right? When I have a lambda applied to some term, I substitute all occurrences of the variable with the term that I was applied with. And so substitution is sort of the basic way you define how to actually run lambda calculus programs. Um, one, one reason why it's substitution and not some sort of like abstract machine or like underlying compute machine is because when the lambda calculus was originally being studied, um, people were trying to come up with so-called models of computation, right? Like um, uh, ideas, uh, idealized physical processes that like could embody computation without presupposing the existence of a computer. And substitution, you know, seems like a very reasonable thing you can do. Uh, in this situation. Turing machines, right, it's like this physical machine that reads things and then does things. So uh, so when we want to evaluate simple expressions by hand, uh, substitution is how we're going to do it. Although if you're actually writing a real live programming language like, you know, Haskell, you probably don't actually want to do that. So most languages do something different to actually get their code evaluated. But there's another reason substitution is useful, and that's in the context of optimization and macros. Um, when I um, am optimizing programs, something that I frequently want to do is I want to do inlining. I want to you know, take some uh, 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 expression and uh, put it into some context because maybe that uh, uh, by replacing a variable reference, an indirect variable reference with the actual body of the function in question, I might be able to unlock some more optimization opportunities. And in this context, in the compiler, you can't actually just run the code because you've got tons of variables, tons of free variables that you don't know what they are, right? Like I can't actually run this program, this Haskell program here, because I don't know what A and B are. But I would still like to inline X because that'll reduce, uh, result in a more optimized program. And so when I want to do inlining like this, once again, that's substitution. I'm substituting a variable with some other expression in question. And so uh, real world compilers do substitution all the time. So especially if you want to get into writing compilers, this is something you're going to have to worry about. Um, and um, just recapping a moment, because I want to introduce some vocabulary. This, this, this idea of when I have a lambda expression applied to some term and I do a substitution, this is called beta reduction. So we talked about alpha conversion, just renaming the variables on lambdas. Um, well, beta reductions are also a um, way of, you know, basically finding equivalent lambda terms. And now I'm talking semantically, right? Like, um, two lambda terms represent the same program if they, you know, can beta reduce to each other. And that intuitively makes sense because, uh, like, you know, if I have a program and I, you know, do a bunch of substitution on it, like, I want the resulting program to still be the same, right? Like, an optimizer is no good if it changes what my program means while optimizing. So beta reductions also form an equivalent class. Although when we're computing, you know, usually we run them in one direction, right? Doing the substitutions. 
one more vocabulary thing. When I have a lambda term applied to some other term, um, that's called a red X. So this helps us distinguish between, um, like if I had a free variable X applied to Y, I can't actually reduce this any further because I don't know what X is. But when X is a lambda expression, I can reduce it. And so all the spots where I, reductions are possible are called red X's. Um, and this will become relevant later when we talk about evaluation order because sometimes a lambda expression will have multiple red X's. And then we have to choose which one we're gonna evaluate first. Okay, so let's talk about name capture. So we mentioned that name capture was something we had to be aware of when we were doing alpha conversion because we didn't wanna capture um, free variables. And the same problem shows up again when we want to do substitution. So going back to our example, um, we have let x equal a plus b in let a equal seven in x plus a. So if I just go ahead and blindly substitute x with a plus b, I would end up with this program let a equal seven in a plus b plus a. And I'm gonna claim this is obviously wrong. Why is this obviously wrong? Well, in the original program, um, x um, was being assigned to a plus b, where a and b were some unspecified quantities that were ambiently defined in the um, environment, and, right? a and b were free variables, and we don't know what they could be. They could be 100 and 101, for example. After I did the substitution here, this a is now referring to the let bound a equals seven. So now I'm saying seven plus b plus seven, which is not the same thing as a plus b plus seven. So this is a problem. And what we should have done in the meantime was we should have somehow renamed this let binding to some fresh new variable to make sure that it didn't actually capture the previously free variable that was defined in X. So when we do substitution, we have to make sure that we alpha convert um, any binders that um, shadow any free variables from the expression in, in hand. So just to say that again, um, let's rename bound variables, alpha converting them so that they don't capture free variables. What are your questions? So on this slide, I have the full rules for doing capture avoiding substitution. And so I'm gonna walk through them one by one. Um, although, uh, most of the black rules are very normal, and it's only the red rule, which is the important one, where the magic of capture avoiding substitution happens. So first, let me explain the syntax. So um, this is, this is once again, standard PL syntax, although there's actually a few different syntaxes for substitution, but I like this one because it's mnemonically clear. So what this is saying is that um, take the lambda expression X and then substitute all occurrences of X with E. So, so the brackets say that a substitution is going on, and then on the inside, we just give a mapping saying what we want the substitution to be. So when we look at this equation, we say when we are substituting X to E and we have an X, well, just replace X with E. It does exactly what you expect it to. Similarly, if we have a variable and we're trying to substitute X, but that variable is not X, well, just keep the variable. Don't do anything special. Uh, and then these examples also operate very similarly. So if I want to substitute E1 and E2, well, do the substitution on E1 and do the substitution on E2. Um, just do it recursively. Uh, and uh, similarly, if I have a lambda expression, and um, okay, so, so now, okay, so, so the, the, these are the simple cases. Now, what happens with the lambda expression? So if I have a lambda binding x to e1, and I have a substitution from x to e, what should I do in this case? Now, if I was just sort of not thinking very um, hard, I might replace the x with an e, but that's not actually valid, right? Lambda terms have to bind variables. They, you never put a expression on the left-hand side of the period in a lambda term. And indeed, if we think about what's going on here, what's going on here is it's saying, hey, when, when there were free occurrences of X, I wanted to replace those with E, but now I'm rebinding X to refer to some local uh, var variable in the context of E1. So I don't actually care about what X was outside of this Lambda expression because, well, you know, that's cool. X might've been a million or 500, but inside this expression, it's whatever I bound it to. So in this situation, I just ignore 
the substitution and I stop. I don't need to substitute anymore. Similarly here, um, when the variable in question is um, a y, and, uh, and uh, so this time I'm not binding it, well, if x is not in the free variables of the expression that I'm substituting in, I can just go ahead and keep recursively substituting y inside of e1. So now we're getting to the capture avoiding substitution part, right? So the stipulation I wrote here was that x, the uh, variable that I'm binding right here, must not be in the free variables of E. Because if it were in the free variables of E, then E would be some expression that's trying to refer to some outer concept of X. And if so, if I don't rename the X, then it'll get bound in the situation and that's bad. Um, you know, going back to this example, right? Like um, in, this, in this expression, uh, the expression A plus B has free variables A and B. And so it's not valid to just plug it in to the X inside here because a is the actual variable being bound in the situation. So when, uh, when x is in the free variables of E, what should we do? Well, we should rename. So what we should do is we should rename the lambda to some new uh, name, y prime, um, where y prime is some fresh name. Um, ideally, uh, what I mean by freshness is it's just a name that you've never seen before. It's a completely unique name that has never before seen in the program. Technically, any name that is not in the free variables of um, E or E1 would work, but uh, it's often simpler to just like come up with a new unique name from whole cloth. So when we do this alpha conversion, we actually need to re replace all the occurrences of y with y prime in E1, right? Because we're renaming the bound variable. So if the binding changes, then all the uses have to change. And then finally, we can do the substitution as we were planning to do before without worrying about capture in this case. All right, what are your questions? This is the important slide because in the homework for this week, uh, the Lambda Calculus homework, uh, you're gonna implement capture avoiding substitution. And this is the slide you're gonna look to to figure out what your capture avoiding substitution function should do. Questions, question? Okay. Um, oh, uh, and this slide just um, says what, um, in more precise terms, what y prime is allowed to be. It's allowed to be any variable as long as it's not x because x is what we're substituting and that would be very confusing. It's not allowed to be any of the free variables in E1 because if it were, then it wouldn't be a valid alpha conversion. And it's not allowed to be any of the free variables in E because, well, um, you know, we would just be capturing something else in that case. So no, no improvement. There's a question. Um, the question is, is it required to do capture avoiding substitution when using de Brown indices? That's a great question. And um, clearly de Brown indices have no names, so how would you even rename in the event? So de Brown indices do not need capture avoiding substitution. The, the downside of de Brown indices is they need something else. They need what we call renumbering. Because uh, remember the way de Brown indices work is that when you have some variable, um, it's just a number saying how many lambdas you have to go uh, to find the uh, lambda that the de Brown indice, uh, index refers to. So if I have a number like zero, and then I want to substitute it into some uh, nested stack of lambdas, I need to renumber it to be five or six or however many lambdas to get back to the same old lambda. So that can be quite a lot of bookkeeping and kind of hard to keep track of. Um, but that's okay because in the lab, you won't have to implement de Brown indices. Um, you'll just have to uh, convert to and from them. So uh, any other questions while we, while we bask in this slide? Okay, so I wanna summarize. So I talked about alpha equivalents and I talked about beta reductions. And in fact, um, these form what we call an equational theory uh, in lambda calculus. Namely, uh, it tells us um, when two programs are equivalent or not. So um, two programs are equivalent if they are alpha convertible or if they beta, one program beta reduces to the other or, and there's one last thing which is called eta reduction which just says that if I have a lambda x dot e dot x, uh, sorry, e space x, 
Um, this uh, lambda expression is kind of redundant. You don't need it. Um, you can just write e instead, right? Because what does this function do? It takes in an argument and then passes in that argument to e. Well, e is a function. It takes an argument. There's no need to like do this extra passeru. So you just directly uh, directly pass it in in this case. Um, the equational theory is not that useful for this class, but like if you want to go into theory, um, one of the things that you know we're gonna think about in general is like when are two programs equal to each other. And so, uh, like you know, this equational theory tells us, hey, you know, this is precisely when two programs are equivalent. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about capture avoiding sub substitution. Last call for questions on capture avoiding substitution. Going once. Yes, this one. Yeah, I'll explain that. So eta um, expansion or reduction contraction um, basically says uh, this program and this program are equivalent. So to understand why they're equivalent, um, uh, let me see. Can I explain this differently? So say I'm writing some Haskell code, and um, let's swap for a second. Let's say I'm writing some Haskell code, and I um, am writing a function, and I'm writing a function like uh, you know, f of x equals, um, let me think, sum x. Okay, so this is a this is a valid function, and it, what it says is, you know, give me a list of x, and, and um, I'll sum it together. So here's a very reasonable thing I can do in this case, right? And that gives me six. Um, but it turns out you don't actually need to write the x. You could write this instead, and this would have the exact same effect, right? So now what I'm saying is, well, let f be the function sum, and this will do exactly the same thing. And so eta reduction just says, hey, you don't actually need the extra um, uh, lambda uh, variables um, if you're just going to apply them directly um, to something. You can just omit them. And um, it, it's, it's needed um, for like sort of kind of hokey technical reasons in the lambda calculus, namely, you couldn't actually prove that these programs were equivalent using only alpha conversion or beta reduction. So you need one more rule to actually make it work out. Uh, great question. Any other questions? All right, so let's move on to the last part of this lecture, namely evaluation order. So um, here's a question for all of you. Uh, how should I evaluate a Lambda program that looks like this? Pausing for a moment. So what do I got here? So I've got a Lambda expression x dot x, so just an identity function, and I have a red x here being applied to this um, inner expression. And what's this inner expression? Well, it's also an application. And um, in the chat, someone has offered that this evaluates to z. And the answer is yes, indeed, it does evaluate to z. But it evaluates to z in two possible ways. Um, one possible way we can do this evaluation is we can first do the outer red x. So what we're going to do is we take this lambda x dot x, and we substitute in the occurrence of x with lambda y dot y z. And then it gives us lambda y dot y z, and then it finally gives us z. So we do these two beta reductions, outer and then the remaining one. But there's another order we can do it. We can do the inner reduction first, namely substituting all occurrences of y with z, giving us uh, uh, lambda x dot x z, and then finally beta reducing to z. So two possible evaluation strategies because there are multiple red x's in this lambda expression. One question you might very reasonably ask is, does it matter what order I do the red x's? And in fact, there's a very interesting theorem called the Church-Rosser theorem that says that if a lambda expression reduces to a normal form, uh, it doesn't matter what order you do the reductions. And um, what is meant by normal form here? Well, that just means a uh, expression that doesn't have any more uh, red x's. So there's, there's no more lambda, uh, lambda apply to some value. You're, you're out of things to do, right? So in the example, z is a normal form because there are no more lambdas. Now, there's a very important caveat here, which is it only says if you reduce to a normal form, 
then it doesn't matter what order you do the reductions. And um, to see why this um, or uh, this uh, reducing to normal form matters, um, there's a very interesting lambda term called omega. And uh, let's take a look at what this lambda term is. So once again, we've got two functions. This is a function that takes lambda x, uh, so it takes an x as an argument, and then applies x to x. That's a very curious thing to do. In a real world program, this is not really something you'd ever really want to do, but humor us for a moment, right? So, you know, this function uh, gets called with itself as an argument. So this curious function lambda x, x dot x, um, what are we going to apply it to? Well, let's apply it to lambda x, 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 namely the exact same term. So what exactly does this lambda term reduce to? Well, let's, let's run through it. So to do a beta reduction, we need to replace all occurrences of x with um, the term. So um, we have two occurrences of x, x, and we're going to substitute all x's with lambda x, x, x. Um, note there's no sort of problems with capture because uh, we're not trying to substitute under a binder. We're, we're substituting away the binder itself. So we go ahead and do this reduction, replacing all occurrences of x with lambda x dot x, x. And hey, this looks familiar. In fact, um, omega has no normal form. It can be infinitely beta reduced. Whenever you beta reduce omega, you get back omega. So this is like a sort of infinite looping term. And so now, um, so, so I haven't actually answered the question. The question I asked posed originally was, um, you know, does it matter what order you evaluate things? And because omega has no normal form, it's a very useful um, uh, tool for observing um, sort of naughty situations where evaluation order does matter. For example, let's take this example. So um, once again, what is this lambda expression doing? Well, we've got a lambda expression, lambda x, y. So what I'm doing is I'm taking an argument x, but I'm throwing it out. I'm ignoring it, and I'm always reducing uh, y. So how many red x's are in this program? Well, it's not obvious here because I've written omega in a abbreviated form, but omega internally has a red x, right? Because it's um, you know actually lambda x, 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 and then lambda x, x, x. So omega has a red x, but there's also the top level red x, which actually applies lambda x dot y to omega. So what happens if I go ahead and reduce the outer red x? Well, the omega will get dropped into x. It'll disappear because there's no occurrences of x. And I'll just end up with y, which is a normal form. But if I go ahead and reduce the um, uh, omega, well, omega beta reduces to itself. And so I'll end up with lambda x dot y omega. And, you know, I once again have this choice. And indeed, I can cause myself to loop infinitely rather than evaluate to the normal form in the situation. And so, like, sure, in the world of theory, we might not care about, um, you know, whether or not we get to our destination or not. But in real world programming, we definitely do care if our program's infinite loop versus give, it, give us the right answer. So, hey, evaluation order might be important. So, so the lambda calculus, remember, we just said beta reductions are a thing you can do, and they, um, they just uh, can apply in any situation where you have a red X, and they tell you when things are equivalent. So to have an evaluation strategy, we need to say what we are going to evaluate first. Which red Xs are we going to do first? And so there are two very popular evaluation strategies. In fact, there are infinitely many evaluation strategies, right? Because you might have as many red X's as you want in an expression, and which one are you going to do? But there's only there's 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 two that like really are important. Uh, so one is what we call call by value. So how does call by value work? Well, um, uh, call by value operates in much the same way you would expect a normal eager. Uh, language to work, a, like like in JavaScript. So how does it work? So let's say that we have some function application. So we've got some non-trivial expression E1 being applied to some non-trivial expression E2. And so we want to actually run this program. So what do we do? So first, we evaluate E1 um, and keep evaluating it until we get a function. So uh, you know we do as many beta reductions until we get a lambda. We don't keep going, right? Because this lambda might have more red X's inside of its body, but those don't get executed. You only execute enough to compute what the function you want to call is. 
then you go ahead and start you executing you start executing e2 you execute 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 until it gets into some normal form once again uh in this case the normal form is just uh um a uh, expression that doesn't have a top level red x which would have meant that you could just keep evaluating it uh, until you get there um, in javascript right you can think of a normal form as being a number or an object or something like that right not not some sort of intermediate computation where you're still computing and once you've done that finally you're allowed to actually do the final uh, uh, beta reduction on the outer red x um, at that point in time questions about call by value Uh, what does the star mean here? So, um, right. So I've been using the arrow beta to say do a beta reduction. So the star just means we may do many beta reductions before we get here. Okay. So going back to our example of lambda x y omega, um, in call by value, um, this would infinite loop. Why does it infinite loop? It infinite loops because um, the left hand side. Is a lambda expression, but the right-hand side is not a normal form. There's still a red x at the top level, so I'm obligated to keep evaluating it. And once again, this should jive with your intuition about how JavaScript works. If I call a function, and one of the arguments I try to pass in is a function that infinite loops, then I would expect that function to get stuck infinite looping before I actually call the function itself. So you know, call by uh, Call by value um, will eagerly attempt to you know evaluate everything, and if there's a omega, that will just blow up your program, and you'll just you know infinite loop in that situation. Now, call by name um, is a little different. So, like call by value, um, we first beta reduce the first term, the function term, until we get a lambda. Because how are you going to actually do your uh, beta reduction if you don't actually have a lambda on the left hand side? But then we skip the step where we evaluated uh, E2 until it was normal form. So we don't bother doing that. And um, uh, once, we, uh, once we are here, we immediately go ahead and substitute X with E2. So we don't bother evaluating E2, we just immediately do the substitution. And this is very similar to Haskell. Um, because in Haskell, Haskell's lazy, so we don't bother evaluating arguments until they're actually needed, aka when until they're actually inside the body they're being used. There's a caveat here. The caveat here is that um, call by name will uh, happily duplicate a big and expensive computation as many times as x shows up inside the body of e1 prime. Um, Haskell's a little smarter. It does um, something called memoization with thunks so that uh, you only still have to evaluate E2 once even though you're delaying its evaluation. So going back to our example here, when I have lambda x dot y omega and I um, reduce it, um, I don't bother trying to beta evaluate omega. I just go straight to y and then I'm done. So call by name will let me evaluate more prog programs than call by value would have let me do. Any questions about call by name? In other words, call by name only does what is absolutely necessary. So to summarize, uh, lambda terms may have many red x's, right? A red x is when I apply a lambda to some other term. Any red x is a valid candidate for beta reduction. Evaluation order tells us which red x we will evaluate. Um, and evaluation is not guaranteed to find a normal form because it might, you know, get stuck uh, evaluating some uh, useless, you know, infinite loop. Whereas if you had found some other order to do the evaluation, you might have skipped it. So call by value says evaluate the function and the arguments before beta reducing. Whereas call by name says evaluate the function and then immediately beta reduce, um, duplicating the uh, work um, if, um, if necessary. And that's it for the set roadmap on this class. Um, so I'm going to conclude. Um, if you've got questions, please line them up. And, and then in the remaining time, I'm going to do a little uh, extra fun um, bonus, bonus topics. Um, we'll figure something out. 
So to conclude, Lambda Calculus is a formal system. So what do I mean by formal system? Well, we define some syntax and we define some rules for how uh, Lambda terms are equivalent with each other. And um, with this very well-defined definition of the language, right? Because there, aren't, there isn't that much stuff to do, we can now study it and um, see some properties of it. And um, when people study other programming languages, they often take the Lambda calculus and they add extra stuff to it. And there's still formal systems in this situation. So you're never gonna actually use the Lambda calculus um, for real, but it's a really useful tool for understanding what your programs will do in other situations. There's a question in chat. Could evaluating a function also result in an infinite loop? Uh, and the answer, let me think, well, how do I answer this? I mean, certainly, uh, yes. Uh, in particular, right? Uh, in all these examples, I said E1 will evaluate into a lambda x E1 prime, but that's not necessarily always the case, right? E1 could be omega. And in that case, you would just not terminate in this case. Neither call by value nor call by name would terminate in that case. Any more questions? Okay, so what I wanna do now is I want to uh, have some fun with church encodings. And we'll use this as an opportunity to reinforce some of the topics uh, in the, from the lecture. So let me swap for a moment. Um, oops, I should have, I should have gotten this ready beforehand. Give me a sec. And always waiting for questions. <laughs> Where's my tablet? Okay, uh, we'll we'll do this um differently. So let me. I should test this next time. Sorry about that. All right, so let's talk about um. Let's talk about church encodings. So. I promised um, that the Lambda Calculus is able to define arbitrary data types. And so uh, this might be a bit um, shocking because uh, like it's all, uh, it's all functions. So like how the heck are you gonna do this? And the answer is, um, well, uh, you just represent all your data as functions. So let's look at um, how the church encoding for uh, um, Booleans works. So take it on faith that the, um, the representation for true is a function that um, takes in two arguments and returns the first argument. And the uh, representation for false is a function that takes in two arguments and returns the second argument. So this is the church encoding for Booleans. And let's see a little bit about why this works. So what are things you expect to be able to do with Booleans? Well, one very important thing that you should be able to do with Booleans is you should be able to um, do an if statement on them, right? You want some function that takes in a Boolean, takes in a true branch and a false branch, and then, you know, if the, uh, and let's, uh, I'm not gonna put in the implementation of this yet, but uh, you would want these equations to hold, right? So namely, if I ran cond tr true tf, that would be t, and if I ran cond false tf, that would be false. So, my claim is that these definitions for true and false make it possible to implement cond 
in the lambda calculus. So let's see how we're going to do that. So, um, so cond is going to be lambda term takes b, takes t, and it takes f. And what am I going to do here? Well, I'm going to say this. So it's going to take b, it's going to take t, and it's going to take f. And it's going to call b with t and f. And if this makes you a little nervous because, you know, uh, I am using tons of Haskell syntax, remember that uh, this is also equivalent, right? So con is a lambda expression that takes a b, it produces a lambda expression that takes a t, and it produces a lambda expression that takes an f, and then finally gives me b, t, f. And I've, I've added all the parentheses. I can add more parentheses if you're still nervous. Okay, so is everyone following um, the definitions of these functions right now? I'm gonna expand these as well so that um, they're, they're clear for those of you who are a little uncomfortable with the parentheses. Okay, so, so this I claim works and let's see why it works. In particular, let's actually try running it on an example. So a good example is con true tf, right? So let's go ahead and start beta reducing. So first what I need to do is I need to replace all of the, um, the variables with their actual um, implementations. So we'll go ahead and inline in con, a lot of parentheses. We'll go ahead and inline in true, more parentheses. And um, T and F will just treat as free variables because we don't really know what they are. Um, in fact, let me let me call them TE and TFE uh, so that we don't mix them up with the T and the F inside cond. Okay, so we got a lot of stuff. It's a bit of a mouthful. Let me um, let me like add some white space to like make it easier. So this is our outer red X, right? This is the lambda expression, and then this is um, this is the first argument. This is the second argument. This is the third argument. Uh, Okay, so let's do some beta reductions, okay? So when we do a beta reduction in this situation, uh, we're gonna first uh, work on the innermost uh, application because, well, there, there is only one red X in this, namely this, this red X. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace all occurrences of B with lambda X, lambda Y, X. So let's go ahead and do that. So getting getting rid of um, getting rid of b. So I have lambda t, then I have lambda f. B got substituted with lambda x, lambda y, x. I'm omitting the parentheses. Hope you guys don't mind. Um, and I, I'm going to uh, no, I'm not going to do that. And then I still have. Uh, so this this is my resulting lambda expression with t and then f. So this is the result of having reduced this, this sub-expression. And I need to tack on te and tf here. So now I have two possible beta reductions, but let me just go ahead and do the outer ones first. So now I've got another beta reduction, namely, sorry, red x, which is this. This lambda apply with te. So I'm going to replace all occurrences of t with te. So let's do that. So I have lambda f, lambda x, lambda y, x, t, f. But t got replaced with t, e. So I have this lambda expression. And then remember, I, I just did this red x, so there's still one more variable left. So now I have t, f. And now what am I going to do? Well, let's just do that last one. So lambda x. Lambda y, x, t, e, t, f. Cool. Now I've got another beta reduction, this x, substitute in t, e, giving me lambda y, t, e, t, f. And finally, one final reduction where I substitute in y to be t, f, but it gets ignored. So now I have t, e. Um, and anywhere I said TF, I actually meant FE, so sorry about that. And so we see, indeed, that 
this giant expression evaluates to TE, which is exactly what we wanted because we wanted con true TE TF to be equal to TE. We are out of time, but I'm happy to answer any questions folks might have about um, this, this sequence. Um, really, the point was just to give an example of doing a ton of beta reductions, right? It's all very regular, but um, um, somehow uh, this works. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, on Wednesday, we will be um, sort of just talking about more Haskell. All right, see you all then.